Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Do our good deeds count for anything? Is there a difference between a wicked person and a person who behaves correctly most of the time? What does it mean to be a child of Abraham? Who gets what inheritance? What is the inheritance of those who do not keep the law? No, you guessed wrong. This week's episode is not about Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's about Ezekiel chapter 33. If only people knew. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 41 of the Bible as Literature podcast. I had the good fortune this weekend to discuss Ezekiel chapter 33 with the adult class in the Ephesus school. And working through this chapter, I had the distinct feeling once again that I had signed up to be in a book club with the Apostle Paul. It just seems to me that so many of the themes that we stumble across in Ezekiel are reflected in Paul's letters. So what's going on at the outset of chapter 33? Right before this come the oracles against the nations, where it's talking about Pharaoh and everything that Pharaoh did and Babylon and everything that they did. The conclusion I came to was that this is a warning that, okay, these people were very high and mighty and thought very highly of themselves, and so they fell as a result because of their own pride. And then we come into chapter 33, and the Lord is saying to Ezekiel, go speak to the people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, he's saying go and speak warnings before being destroyed or being attacked. And here we had chapters 31 and 32, which are warnings. And now we have a discussion about how that warning works. And so the watchman, his job is to warn the people. This chapter makes it clear that whether the people respond or not is not a reflection on whether the watchman did his job or not. It reminds me, again, of Paul's letters. It's very clear that Paul is responsible and running the race to deliver his message to Rome to deliver his message wherever he goes so that when he stands before the judgment seat, he cannot be found guilty of not delivering the teaching. Whether or not the people accept the teaching is a different matter, but he has to make sure that the teaching sets foot in the different areas of the Roman Empire. Right, and his job is to warn the people. If he warns the people and people repent, great. If he warns the people and they don't repent, it's not his problem. If he doesn't warn them and they don't repent, then the people who didn't repent are guilty, but so is the watchman. And that's the thing that is important in this section, is that the watchman's job is simply whether he delivers the message or not. And we saw this back in chapters 3 and 4 of Ezekiel when he was talking about how stubborn the people are going to be. Don't worry about it. They're going to be stubborn. That's not your problem. Your problem is that you have to say the thing. You don't have a choice about that. The prophet feels rejected, but it's irrelevant. He just has to be giving the message. But then the interesting thing that is added on to this is that just because you're righteous all the way up until this crucial moment, at that crucial moment you have a choice of doing the righteous thing or doing the unrighteous thing. And how you were before that doesn't matter. So if you're righteous all the way to this point and then you do the unrighteous thing, the righteousness doesn't matter. And you, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him when he transgresses. So it doesn't matter how righteous you are. If you transgress, it invalidates whatever righteousness you may have or think you have brought to the table up until that point. Again, it's very clearly what Paul is saying about the law in the New Testament, that if you can't do it all, what you've done is immaterial. Right. I mean, the Torah sets a measure that no one can live up to so that everyone would come to understand that there is only one God and he is not you. By the same token, if you're unrighteous and it comes to that crucial moment, 
and you do the righteous thing, then it doesn't matter if you were unrighteous before that or not. In the Gospels, the Pharisees were very upset by that when the prostitute washed Jesus' feet with her tears. Well, why would he allow that to happen? When it came to accepting the word, she accepted it. And Jesus says, what problem do you have with her? And this is how he exposed their hypocrisy because they thought that what you had banked up to that point mattered. And what's saying here in Ezekiel and what Jesus is saying in that passage is no, what you banked up to that point does not matter. It's double or nothing every time. You have the opportunity of doing the right thing at this moment. What happened before that doesn't matter. So this is interesting because he's saying this after the warning that was given about Pharaoh. The people, whether they were righteous or not, now you're hearing the warning. So now that you're hearing the warning, what are you going to do? Yes, and again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge gives back what he has taken by robbery and walks in the statutes of life committing no iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. As you said, it comes down to the choice that you make in this moment. And the thing is that laziness and idleness and passiveness are the problem. Because you can't say, because I was righteous up to this point, I can let this one slide. By the same token, you can't say, I've been bad enough up to this point, what does one more matter? So if you've been wicked up until this point, you can't say, what does one more matter? You have to step up and deliver. But then you're still not off the hook. Because technically, God could still throw you out because everything you did up to this moment was problematic. So you are always under pressure to deliver, but you are never guaranteed of deliverance. And this is an ominous ominous text when it is pronounced in context of the destruction or the fall of Jerusalem and the exile, right? It's striking reading through this, I want to say Pauline logic, but Paul is Ezekielian. Ezekiel is not Pauline. So we're reading through this Ezekielian logic, and then after we realize that you're screwed, whether you're righteous or you're wicked, you're all on the razor edge of God's judgment, sort of dangling there hoping he won't decide against you. You now go through another one of Ezekiel's time warps and suddenly we're in the 12th year of the exile, in the 10th month, on the 5th day of the month. So up until now we've heard about the job of the watchman to warn the people, the responsibility of the watchman to heed the warning himself, the responsibility of the people to heed the watchman's warning, who gets in trouble for not heeding what, when, why, and how, and so forth. Then we hear about how God judges everyone, and now suddenly we're, we're actually fast-forwarded to the exile. So the word of the Lord came to the prophet, saying, Son of man, the inhabitants of these waste places in the land of Israel keep saying. So now there's no watchmen. Now the land is wasted. So there is it's, no, it's, yeah, Jerusalem, it's post-watchmen. Jerusalem is falling. Abraham was only one man, yet he got possession of the land, but we are many. The land is surely given to us to possess. The problem there is that in verse 24, Abraham is the one who got the possession from God. He got the land of Israel. So we are the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, we are in line to inherit the land that Abraham got. It's as if the Lord gave the land 100% to Abraham, and now we inherit it by virtue of being the children of Abraham. Which seems really silly. I mean, that's re- I feel like I'm reading Galatians. I mean, it's a pretty silly claim to make that you have this de facto right to this inheritance as sons of Abraham in the flesh, when we just heard this long explanation of how whether you're wicked or you're righteous, you're living on the razor's edge, and you could be out like that. Well, so it, it rings really hollow. And it also is strange because it's assuming that the Lord is no longer determining who's inherited. He made his decision. He gave it to Abraham. They're assuming that because they're children of Abraham, they inherit the land through him. Rather than the fact that they have to be like Abraham to so inherit the land from the Lord. Every generation has the opportunity in Genesis to submit to the will of God and find life or to reject the will of God unto destruction. I mean, that's the language here. I mean, Mm -hmm. Ezekiel is talking about those who don't submit to the will of God as surely dying and those who submit as surely living. And now they want to talk about inheriting the land and living, right? I mean, there's a connection between the land and life and prosperity. Well, it's also counterfactual because we inherited the land. It's like, well, Jerusalem has fallen. The enemy has what taken land it is there? So, like, That's the other thing. What, what land are you talking about? The destruction. Uh, the- unless, unless you're being upstart and you want to start not blaming God but shaking your fist at him. 
This is our land. How come we don't have it? But anyways, therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord your God, You eat flesh with the blood. They're transgressing the law. And lift up your eyes to your idols and shed blood. And we talked about this on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a gross transgression because the dem, the blood, is the domain of God. Yeah, and in addition to that, this is the command that was given to Noah. This is even before Abraham. The way it's interpreted in Judaism today is that there are certain laws that were given to all of humanity, but the majority of laws were given to the Jews. This is how Judaism interprets it. But these laws that were given to Noah, they apply to everybody, every human being, because after Noah, the children of Noah is everybody. So they aren't even fulfilling the most basic precepts. This is long before any Ten Commandments, and they can't even do those two commandments. A fortiori, how is it possible for them to even do the Ten Commandments if they can't even do two even more basic commandments? Right, so then shall you possess the land if you can't do these basic commandments? You resort to the sword, you commit abominations, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. And what's interesting always about sins that pertain to adultery or fornication, they deal with the question of fidelity, right? And we're talking here about idolatry and infidelity, which are linked. Shall you then possess the land? Do you think that you're a child of Abraham because you fast-forwarded to 2014 and someone took a DNA sample? Unfortunately, this is how people still talk about being a child of Abraham, which is why there's so much suffering in the world today. But obviously that's not the currency of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is saying, look, if you want to see who a child of Abraham is, look at their behavior. A child of Abraham does not transgress the law. And so the inheritance of righteousness is the land. What's funny here is that by using this as the standard that he's holding the people up to, what he's implying is that there are even Gentiles who are more righteous than you. So how can you claim to possess the land when there are Gentiles who deserve to possess the land more than you do? I think I'm going to have a bumper sticker that says Ezekiel 33 equals Galatians. I don't know if people will understand the bumper sticker or even care, but it will give me comfort. Although since my wife doesn't want me to have any bumper stickers on the car, I guess I'll have to hold off. I did have another one made, which was from a Genesis, you know, the famous line in Genesis chapter 6, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man upon the earth. That bumper sticker people would have understood and probably egged my car. But anyways, <laughs> we're getting off topic here. So, as I live, surely those who are in the waste places shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured. So there's a reversal. You want to wield the sword, so as Christ says in the New Testament, so shall you die by the sword. You show no respect for the lifeblood, the dem. And so now it's not you who will devour others or devour God's creatures. It's the beasts that will devour you. It's this mechanism of judgment. Verse 11 Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I don't want you to screw up. I want you to turn back. I want you to put down the sword so that you can live in peace with your neighbors. I want you to show respect for creation, respect for the lifeblood, which is my domain, and not just abuse animals either as part of a cultic ritual or for your own enjoyment. That's not what they're there for. I'll never forget a parishioner at St. Elizabeth was telling me he's from Galilee and he grew up in an Israeli Arab town he's a Palestinian and he was telling me that when he was a young man they'd have chicken for a meal and his dad would say a prayer in which he gave thanks for the sacrifice that the chicken made so that the family could be fed now in our culture this sounds ridiculous because we live in a culture where we kill chickens on manufacturing lines and we give them antibiotics because they live in terrible squalor. And we give them cocaine so that they eat more and get bigger faster. So that we can slaughter them and sell them the way we sell M&Ms. So in that context where we are so abusive of God's domain, the life in creation. The idea of giving thanks for a chicken that sacrificed its life so that we could live is ridiculous. But that's exactly what's at stake here. Looking at the way that the land becomes a desolation and a waste, it's interesting because they say, we want to inherit the land. It says, because of your unrighteousness, that the land has become uninhabitable. And exactly. this is reflected in Hosea also because if you look at chapter 1, the problem is that the land is polluted, not the people. 
the land is polluted, but why is the land polluted? Is because the people are mistreating the land because they're using the land for their idolatry and they're taking advantage of what the land is producing and giving it to idols. And so it's as if they're offering their own mother up to other men. So here we have the idea that the abominations that they committed in verse 29 created the desolation of the land. Absolutely. They brought the curse upon the land and they claim to want to inherit the land, but in fact they abuse the land, are selfish about the land, and self-righteous about the land. And this is the problem. They're so possessive and self-righteous about it that they forget that this is something that was given to them as a gift and something for them to nurture and to treasure out of gratitude towards the Lord. But God, as Paul tells us, is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. And as for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes forth from the Lord. We hear about this in Matthew where he echoes the teaching, this people's lips are close to me, but their hearts are far from me. It's the same mechanism here. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with their lips they show much love, but their heart is set on their gain. It's a very damning verse. And lo, you are like one who sings love songs, to them anyways, you are like one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, meaning that religion for them is entertainment. And they hear it, but they won't do it. They hear it, but they won't do it, but it sounds nice. As you always say, they're checking off their box. We went, and we listened to the prophet speak, and it sounded so lovely. I mean, how often do we Orthodox talk about liturgy that way? That oh, liturgy constantly. is how beautiful and wonderful liturgy is, but the admonition of loving the neighbor and doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord, that becomes secondary. When this comes and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. This reminds me of the prayer in the baptism when the prayer speaks about the Lord coming and then there's a comma and it says, and he shall come. And then the prayer continues. It's not a question of if he will come. And the way I described this on Sunday was when a seed goes in the ground, a plant grows. But eventually that plant will reach its full stature and no matter how beautiful it is, even if it's a mighty tree, it will eventually die and go back to the earth. Creatures grow, they achieve maturation, they're strong and beautiful, but then they eventually die and go back to the dust. Then you look at systems organized by mammals, namely humans. They build settlements, they build cities, they build empires. These things grow and will eventually go back to the dust because the creatures that make them grow and eventually go back to the dust. So. The fall of Jerusalem, historically, is an inevitability. The fall of any city, the fall of any nation, the fall of any corporation, the collapse of any institution, the rotting of any building, none of these are a question of if, they're all a question of when. And the problem is the Israelites believe that they're special in this passage, and that they inherited it, and that this is protected by God in a special way, and therefore they're safe because of their righteousness. And what the Lord keeps reiterating is that just because you're righteous up to this point does not mean that you're safe when the sword comes. And in fact, the reason why the sword is coming is because you were not righteous. And not only were you not righteous, you weren't even as righteous as the basic law for the Gentile. Yes, yes. But the point that I'm making about the mechanism at the end is that when scripture says it will come, it's not a fortune cookie, nor is it a prediction per se. It's simply providential. It's simply a statement about how things work. The fall of the city will come because we know from the earlier passage that no matter how righteous you are, you will commit wickedness. So it's fatalistic in that sense. And right. I think understanding that is extremely important. Right, and the people have misunderstood it. And then when the city is destroyed, rather than saying it just happened, the Lord gives them a lens through which they can understand this, thanks to the watcher who tells them the reason why this happened. It almost sounds like it could have been avoided if the people just weren't so terribly rotten. And so what it does is it uses the inevitability of human creation and its eventual crumbling 
against the people in order to teach them, in order for them to understand the true nature of righteousness, its unattainability, and the people's ultimate and consistent rejection. So I'm reading Ezekiel 33, and I'm thinking, do I want to be one of the people? Do I want to be the watchman? In the broader context of Ezekiel, do I want to be the conquerors of Jerusalem? No matter which way I turn, you're pretty much in trouble. So I think after reading Ezekiel 33, what I want to do is hide under a rock. Let's look for some rocks. Quickly. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rachel. Right, so have a great week. Thanks. Thanks. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening.